charcuterie live class. Um, I am Sarah Brito. I'm the co-founder of the Good Food 100 Restaurants List, um, which is a nonprofit based here in Denver, Colorado. And you are in my home kitchen here in Colorado. Um, I'm really excited about tonight's class, which I am uh, emceeing with award-winning chef Kelly Whitaker. Uh, also based here in Colorado, who is going to be in one of his restaurants in Denver. And I think that one of the reasons why I might have been asked to MC tonight's Build Your Own Charcuterie class is that my mission with my nonprofit is to celebrate the people and businesses changing the food system for good. And that starts with businesses like the 750 independent family farmers that are part of the Nyman Ranch Network. It also includes hundreds of independent restaurants like Chef Kelly Whitaker's restaurants across the country. And it includes people like you, all of us as eaters who care about where our food comes from and vote with our forks and with our dollars. Um, and so with that, we're really excited because there is no good food, there can be no good food unless there are future farmers. And so tonight's class, if you didn't already know this, is a fundraiser for the Next Generation Foundation to help um, support and grow the next generation of children in the Nyman Ranch family to hopefully continue with the tradition of farming, to stay on the land, to stay in their rural communities, and to continue to grow delicious, good food um, for all of us. So thank you all for joining us tonight. And before I turn things over to Kelly Whitaker, um, or Chef Kelly, um, I'd like to just kind of go through the overview of tonight's uh, flow of how things are gonna work. So to put you all at ease, um, and uh, if you haven't already, I wanna encourage you to pour yourself a glass of wine um, uh, there's some recommendations that were provided for you on the uh, postcard. But the way tonight's gonna flow, uh, our hour or so together around the virtual table is, first we're gonna start with the boxes that you should have all received. And we'll go through um, exactly what's in the box, uh, make sure that you have everything that we need. And then Chef Kelly is gonna talk to you a little bit more about who he is a background on his restaurants, why he's passionate about charcuterie, um, and then you're going to get into building the bo or building the charcuterie board um, with Chef Kelly, and we'll continue the conversation um, throughout while he's actually building and um, hopefully getting some good camera angles of uh, what's on his board. And throughout all of this, I want to encourage you to ask questions. Um, We'll save time towards the end for about 10 minutes of audience Q&A, but we wanna make this as interactive of a class as you desire it to be. So throughout, um, I have someone helping me. Um, so I'm gonna be trying to make a board along with you. I'm gonna be trying to do multitask and hold the conversation with Chef Kelly. And we're gonna be interjecting uh, your questions along the way, uh, saving time uh, at the end uh, as well. So with no further ado, because I know why you're all here, you want to start um, uh, eating uh, soon uh, the charcuterie board, I want to turn it over to Chef Kelly um, to uh, introduce himself, his restaurants, his passion for charcuterie, and begin to talk to you about what's in those uh, yummy boxes that you all should have uh, gotten delivered today. Chef Kelly? Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank all of you for being with us here tonight. Thanks, Simon Ranch, as always, for including us in this important conversation about good food. Uh, I love uh, Sarah for many other reasons than just being my confidant tonight. I'm, it's so nice to see you, Sarah. It's nice to have a glass of wine with you. Um, and, you know, Sarah is one of those people that really believe in the neighborhood restaurant, probably more than any uh, anybody I know and understands sort of the challenges we're up against. And tonight I was asked to be on this and I thought what an opportunity to, you know, come out, talk about and give sort of an escape for tonight. So this is gonna be casual. Like Sarah said, I love the questions. Um, and, uh, you know, 
we're going to eat and drink and talk about uh, some things, charcuterie, but whatever you're feeling. Just if you feel free, if you know our restaurants, uh, feel free to ask us anything or ask me anything. Um, I might not know, but I'll try my best to provide a great answer. Um, so I'm standing in one of my home kitchens too. Um, this is uh, Bruto. Uh, this is uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, my wife is mad because I don't always have the time to <laughs> cook every single night. Uh, but we always love, uh, you know, a lot of the kitchens that we design and even from the very beginning sort of revolve around and feel like uh, a home kitchen. We started Basta in Boulder in 2010 with one single oven like the one behind me. And uh, Bruto is currently uh, closed and we just thought, you know, this is a great space to sort of talk about our beginnings and, um, and uh, you know, think about what we can do in the space. And this is such a cool opportunity for us. Um, so we've, uh, from Boston in 2010, we've been able to uh, sort of expand on a few different things, but uh, really, you know, uh, one of the bigger things we've done in the last couple of years is our second restaurant, The Wolf's Tailor. Um, it is a restaurant focused uh, really on grains and pasta. Uh, pasta being focused on pizza, I really wanted to branch out and get back to some of my roots. And so we were, uh, we decided to do that restaurant and it's currently open and serving and um, I'm cooking there every night. So this is a night off for me and I want it to be fun. Uh, the, the, you know, when we talk about good food and good meat and good charcuterie, it's things near and dear to our heart. And, uh, if we, uh, we currently are very involved in the food supply chain. So we grow grains in the San Luis Valley, uh, with some farmers there. And we opened, uh, in February, our, a local heirloom grain mill, uh, that mills, uh, four or five different varieties of wheat and currently supplying chefs here in Denver with uh, fresh milled flour. Um, so we talk about wheat a lot and tonight we're talking about meat. Um, and this is something that has always had a place on our menu. Um, and it's from the first beginning. And this is probably my, one of my earliest memories of starting Boss I got in the car probably three weeks before opening and just drove to Des Moines, Iowa. And I met um, Herb, who has uh, La Quercia, which is domestically uh, domestically cured prosciutto. And I thought, you know, the same as flour at the time, that often we use double zero flour in pizza. And uh, I discovered that double zero flour can be grown and made in the United States. And that was a real powerful moment for me as a chef. And the same when I drove to Iowa uh, the, for the first time and uh, kind of got introduced to the terroir of Iowa and understood that you could do a lot of things with meat. And one of the companies we, you know, very early adopted was working with Nyman Ranch, seeing the process and actually getting the opportunity to walk some of the farms uh, and, and see the whole thing from these small sort of independent farmers. Um, so uh, let's talk charcuterie. Uh, Sarah, is this a good place to keep me on track? Yeah, you can uh, either talk charcuterie or unpack the box. Um, and Let's unpack uh, the box. Do not make sure everybody has what they're going to need in front of them and then uh, take a step back and talk charcuterie. Yeah, so let's all start to unpack the box. I got to remember, you're in your kitchen too. And yeah, I've got my box. I'm going to, I've already unpacked it, but... Here's what mine came in exactly the same thing that everybody else is came in. But I've got mine all spread out. So you, as you're unpacking things, um, Chef, do you want me to read what's on the card or did you want to do that? Yeah, please okay. go for it. I'm going to start opening some packaging. You guys at home start opening some packaging with us. Yes. Uh, so which is step one. If you're pulling your ingredients out, yeah. Get your ingredients out. Um, you should have two of each of these, which is great because you might be only using one tonight, but you'll be able to build a second board. Um, you should have some hot soppressata. You should have some Genoa salami. You should have some prosciutto, pepperoni, capicola, summer sausage. So in total, there should be six different types of meat. One of them is uh, oblong sausage cylinder shape. 
and the other ones are all flat packages. And then you should have three different types of cheese. Um, you should have the Milton Creamery Prairie Breeze cheese, their truckle cheese, and their quirk cheese. And if you didn't already notice this, I just want to point out that um, the cheese is actually made by one of the same farmers um, that raises hogs for Nyman Ranch. So um, everything in your box um, is coming uh, from hog farmers, including uh, the very special honey, um, which is, if you don't recognize the name, Willis Prairie Honey is actually from Paul Willis, hog farmer number one, the very first hog farmer with Nyman Ranch, who I believe uh, is tuning in with uh, his family in Iowa. So hi, Paul. Um, hi, Paul. I just love this honey. Um, so that should be six pieces, uh, six packages of um, the meat, uh, three packages of the cheese, uh, and the honey. So back over to you, Chef, to talk, uh, to begin to talk about charcuterie. Yeah, so when I approach, uh, you know, this, this, uh, you know, the plating and, and, and sort of putting everything together, it's, it's pretty straightforward. What I love about charcuterie boards is very DIY. And depending on the purpose, depending on the reason, um, you can just build this sort of any way you feel like. So tonight, if you're at home with the family and you want to build a large board, that's great. Um, you know, that's, and it can, honestly, it's, often looked at as the pre-mill or it's looked at the whole mill, I think. Um, and when you, you know, so when you think about it, the first thing I think about is what do I want to put the charcuterie on? Sometimes you see these big, beautiful boards and um, you want to, you know, uh, embellish and do and, uh, you know, host your friends. And that's really great. Uh, this is one of the things that I always go to when uh, having friends over. Uh, but yeah, so first I just have a couple things here, you know, a couple different plates, a couple different boards. Um, so any of this really works. And um, for tonight, I'm just going to use the big wood board just so everyone can kind of see where we're going with it and how to approach it. Um, but yeah, the first thing you want to do is really just get everything in front of you. So you all see on that list that you have the, the wine recommendations and then you have the grocery recommendations. I hope you all started with the wine. Well, yeah, um, and I should plug here, actually, Chef, that um, I, I'm actually sipping a wine from your Boulder restaurant um, because awesome. uh, for those of us living in states that have loosened the, um, the liquor laws during COVID-19, one of the benefits is, is that I'm able to buy wine directly from Colorado restaurants and have it uh, selected by a sommelier. So I'm actually having... Uh, a bubbly rosé, which is very similar to the chocolate from Spain, listed on your uh, postcard with the wine recommendations. Uh, but it's actually a rosé lambrusco, uh, if you're familiar, which uh, chef thought would pair well with my charcuterie. So thank you to your sommelier and to you for your recommendation. For sure. And I'm drinking bubbles as well. I think that when you think about fattiness of meats and um, you know, richness of the cheese and the bread, the acidity of bubbles goes great. Um, and one of the best memories I've had probably just um, driving through Italy was through Parma and thinking about Parma prosciutto or Parma cheese and Lambrusco is real central to that area. And it's just, uh, I have incredible memories of eating prosciutto cheese and uh, sipping Lambrusco. So nice choice. And thanks for purchasing from our restaurant as always. Um, so yeah, I've got a lot of these things in front of me right now. Um, so when thinking about, uh, the next step here, um, you know, you kind of like, when I think about the board, I always, um, want to think about what do I need on it and what do I really can just leave off? What is sort of meaningless in this? So I always try to hit on, uh, not too many crossovers. So when I say that, you don't want too many meats that are the same fat content, the same spice, they use the same wine. And uh, really, it's fun to bring as much diversity to the board as possible. And that means like, you know, find something briny, find something salty, something fatty, uh, something bready. And that's sort of where we started to hear. Uh, and you often see a lot of fruits right now in Colorado. I actually just got my first boulder grown figs uh, <laughs> since I've lived there. Actually, really close to you, Sarah. But um, so I fresh figs are around right now. So I brought in some fresh uh, figs, but 
dates and nuts and all these things really counterbalance the richness of the meat and complement it in other ways and contrast. And I think that is uh, the point. The complementing and contrasting is just so much fun when it comes to this. So um, I love the mix tonight from Nyman. We are working with um, a couple whole muscle meats. Uh, those are, uh, and these are made more in the style of, you know, full salt cure. So if you think about some of these, and if you actually look at them and look at the, the way that they look, the way that they're cut and the, the fat in them, you can kind of see that some look a little more cooked, maybe like a sausage. And we actually have a great sausage as well um, that I'm gonna open. But um, your whole muscle uh, meats tonight are the capricola and the uh, prosciutto. And so again, the, the diversity we're bringing between some cured meats and some uncured or cooked, and then some sausage uh, is what I think about when building the board. I don't want to have too many cured, too many uncured, too many poached, or too many sausages, unless you're in the mood. Again, this is kind of your world, but I love this mix from Nyman because it really kind of uh, hits everything. We've got spicy, fatty, rich. Um, so uh, I usually start with the meat and think about that um, as we start to build the board. Prosciutto is one of those things that, um, you know, should be sliced thin. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well, because some of these things are nicer to, you know, hand cut, uh, like the sausage, because you can kind of choose how thick or how thin you want the sausage. And so that, feel free to... Is that what you're starting with? Should we start... Um, I'm going to start with the prosciutto. Um, the prosciutto, again, if you're hosting friends and you want this thing to look great, I like to start with some of the texture and prosciutto should be laid out. It shouldn't be bunched up. A lot of these you just want to be careful with as you start to plate them. But okay. really, uh, I'm starting with the prosciutto. I shouldn't roll it. You're saying to, to lay it out? Yeah, typically you want to lay, you want to slice thin. And if you start to bunch it up, it's one of those meats that, and you can see the way that Nyman packed it. They sliced it. They put a little piece of paper in between it or parchment. And this is a great thing for prosciutto because they're essentially telling you right now what to do. They're saying, don't let it, you know, get, in. they didn't send it to us just, you know, thrown in a pack. They've taken the care to really separate it with this paper. Um, so, but it's still don't, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of chefs maybe think you sh it should be flat. And, you know, I like the prosciutto because it's one of those things when just, uh, you know, slightly manipulated, you have this like great texture on the board. So that's where I like to start. Okay. And the good thing is, is since we're all doing this in the privacy of our kitchens, and I'm going to uh, take a cue from Massimo Batura, who was always saying in his Instagram videos, wash your hands, you know, wash your hands. We, we're all washing our hands. But the good thing, because we're doing this privately, is we can all nibble and nobody's going to know if you're nibbling along the way, taking a sip of wine. So, sorry, go ahead, Chef. No, this is exactly right. <laughs> I've got to look at this too. I'm like, oh, I want to like eat this right now and I am being watched, um, <laughs> but. Okay, so what are you going to next? Uh, so next, um, again, looking at some of these other, um, you know, so we talked about the whole muscle. So the other ones, I mean, traditional soap rosada and some of these other cuts, they're really a way that, you know, to utilize the whole pig. And it's just so important when you think about how these pigs were raised, how they're processed and really respecting the process. I myself, it's like one of those things when I think about some of these meats and a lot of my friends that actually make these meats as well. You know, I my first thought was like, I shouldn't be having this conversation, but it's always been an important part of my menus and I love it, but it's one of those crafts that stepping out of my day-to-day -day cooking and everything that I just, you really need to dedicate a lot to it. So it's, it's kind of one of those notions that, you know, the cook should cook and the person that really, you know, focuses on this type of craft, um, you know, should, uh, it's, it's a lifelong passion. I think it's a lifelong thing. So um, with some of this, though, with the animal husbandry around it, again, you want to utilize the whole animal. And these really allow you to do that. So we talked about first these whole muscle, and I'll actually, you know, get some of the capricola as well. So we'll just finish off the whole muscle, which is like part of the, uh, you know, shoulder, neck kind of area. 
Um, but again, I'm not trying to roll. I haven't, if you don't have the space, you can kind of start to roll some of these, but a lot of these, I just try to gently put on the board to provide some texture and um, help it get some lift off. So we're gonna finish, we're gonna keep going on the Capricola here, Sarah, and uh, finish off our whole muscle because I believe that's the only two right now. Okay, I'm laying them flat. and. And what would you suggest to people like if they don't, if they're not working with as big of a board as you might have in front of you, would it be okay to roll that as well? The ones that are- uh -huh. It's totally okay. Okay. Again, I would try to just, I would do it in a gen gentle, sometimes you go in the grocery and it's like, and this is a great example. So Genoa is a very easy thing to roll and you're really not gonna mess with the texture, the flavor, any of those things as much. And you can kind of uh, prop those up. Whereas like the prosciutto, again, will stick together. It's gonna be hard to serve. It's gonna be a little more uh, difficult. So we're gonna roll some Genoa since you're in the mood to roll. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll it. And also I'm working with a slightly smaller board than you are. Um, and I know that we've also received a question. Uh, Kelly, you might have to buy some more uh, of this Rosé Lambrusco because we're getting questions about um, the exact wine that I'm drinking. And so uh, as soon as I'm able to open my refrigerator, I'll actually pull out that bottle for you and I'll hold it up close to the screen so that um, you can see it. But I, I was actually introduced to Rosé Lambrusco at Kelly's restaurant, uh, Basta. They also have my favorite, I, I'm not getting paid to tell you this, my favorite regular Lambrusco uh, Lini Lambrusco uh, there there as well. So if you're if you're if you have bad memories of Lambrusco from uh, I don't know the age of everyone in our audience, but you know back in the 80s, um, uh, Lambrusco is different. I encourage you to try it, chill it. It's like Kelly said, it's delicious. You know, some of us have bad memories from uh, you know different wine regions of the way things were back then. But anyways, back to the back to the board. What are you on next? I think you might have gotten ahead of me. So we did salame. We are yeah. So we got the prosciutto. We got the capricola, and now we're starting to work with some of the. Um, well, you said it, salami, salumi, right? Um, the um, these are considered a little more salami because they're uh, uncured often. They're cooked often. Um, so yeah, we're starting to play some of those. One of the things I will point out, Sarah, like you know the purpose of maybe rolling other than just the thing is like, if you're trying to conversate about the board, it's nice to have some of those identifiers, especially if there are these, um, you know, some of the uh, more round and uniform cuts, right. it's better that, you know, maybe you arrange it in a different way. So fanning it out, rolling it, um, treating it a little bit different. So, you know, unless you label it for your friends, it's kind of a nice way to say, you know, did you have this one that prosciutto's laid out or this, this, uh, you know, so I, like I don't that. know. I try to, I try to not do things just to do them. You know, I really like to find reason. And that's like a small detail that I think really uh, goes a long ways when you're doing this. And yeah, I love it. It's like, it's, it's making um, charcuterie more user-friendly and more accessible, especially if you're, I would imagine some of our uh, guests at home are going to introduce this type of eating, uh, perhaps new to friends and it could make it less intimidating uh, to be able to point to and say, oh, the rolled one is this, the round yes. one is that. So, um, yes. Yeah, so let's see, what am I missing here? Um, we've got the hot soprasada, it looks like, and then we're just missing the pepperoni. Okay. And we were debating earlier about pepperoni because I personally use it as a piece of topping and we were talking about you know, just eating pepperoni. And I think about, you know, the kids eating the Lunchables or whatever, and this can be a great meat to eat on its own, especially with some of these cheeses, something that really stands out like this um, in terms of like uh, what the, um, sorry, the uh, pork cheese, which is like a spreadable cheese. This is kind of a great one that we'll talk about, you know, when we talk about the meat and cheese together. Yeah. So um, I, I love what you know, you're saying about the pepperoni and Lunchables because, you know, we were talking about this earlier today. You know, we have, um, as Americans, this idea that fast food is always bad for you. 
But, you know, I think of charcuterie and cheese as fast food. I mean, what is faster than opening your refrigerator, opening a package of Nyman Ranch um, prosciutto, opening some cheese, putting some olives out, serve it with a salad. And to me, that's actually what I'm having for dinner. Um, uh, when this is done and my charcuterie board is done, uh, this board and a salad, uh, is, it, to me, makes a perfect dinner for busy moms who uh, need to put together a fast weekday meal. Um, but also totally. uh, those of us in Colorado and in all the places having a heat wave, who wants to turn on their oven in August when it's 90 plus degrees out? So this is a great way to have, if you've got um, a meat and potatoes eater in your family who you know won't think it's dinner unless there's meat on the plate, uh, this is a great way to put meat on the plate without heating up your whole house when it's uh, almost 100 degrees out. Yeah, it's very traditional and, you know, in the rest of the world that this would be a meal and it, it I agree with you this is this can be the whole thing especially when you add in some of the figs and some of the other things that go along with it it's definitely a complete meal so you can see I'm making little pepperoni cups um I don't know if you like pepperoni cups I was a huge fan of pepperoni cups but uh I'm just taking the pepperoni and I'm just putting a small slit from the middle out and you should try this do you have a knife sir or not I just wonder if this is I do actually. So this is just another way to kind of, so if you take your knife and just cut from the center out and then you can kind of just fold it in and it makes just basically a little satellite, a little cone. But again, another easy way to add some texture to the board. And I'm not saying you need to do this, but it's fun. Why gonna, not? I can't see, um, the audience has a, a, a slightly different angle. Uh, they get to see the uh, the close up views. I only get to see you, so. Oh, you only get to see me. <laughs> oh, but I think I think I might have done it. That's so exciting. I yeah. So just cut one, and it'll stand up and sort of off the board. Yeah, that's great. I love that I learned something new. So yes, so those are all of the um, you know the sliced salami that came pre sliced in the box. Thank you, Nyman, for slicing those for us and what because that makes it really easy. <laughs> What about um, and I, what go ahead. What'd you ask? Uh, the cheese. What are we going to do with the cheese? Well, let's finish the meat just with the okay. sausage. And then, um, yeah, we'll have a little conversation about the cheese, which I'm just been trying today, which is just awesome. So a couple things you can peel this off. Uh, maybe you've seen it both ways. You can definitely just cut right through it. And again, if I'm the host and I'm like starting to build the board, this is somewhere where snacking becomes kind of important um, because you can kind of choose, you know, it, like, you know, depending, you know, if it's kids, if it's adults or whatever, you might want to, you know, uh, not like eat a big, a larger piece of sausage. So this is a, this sausage can be cut thick. It's really nice thin as well. Um, you know, but this is your world. So that's why, it's always fun to have some sliced meats, but including some, a couple unsliced, like the sausage is a great way to just kind of, um, you know, take things into your own hands right now. So we're going to cut some of the sausage. And again, you can peel that. You can not peel it for the guests. Um, I'm going to go ahead and peel these off. And about how thick are you cutting these? You know, I'm just cutting about, you know, Probably, probably about the width of a pen or pencil. Okay. And so, so that's pretty thick, um, only because we have a lot of thin uh, cut things. So just going a little bit bigger, but thin is, I mean, again, it's your world. I would try both. It smells great just cutting into it. Oh yeah, the, yeah. these and types of sausages are, are so fun. Discs? Yeah, I'm just doing it as discs. You could cut on a bias if you want, but um, you know, this allows you to. For all of us amateurs, kind of, that means on the diagonal. <laughs> kind of do what you want, yeah. Okay. So now we have the meat down. Um, and again, we've kind of left a few spaces. There's spaces all over the board. And you asked earlier about, you know, the size, like what if we don't have a big giant board? Um, I would say, you know, again, a great way to think about this. 
And especially right now, you know, um, about building individual plates or, um, you know, smaller boards. It's really, I like to think about this type of meat and the richness of it. Uh, you know, if you're going to, um, if you're going to have this sort of as a pre-mill, maybe like two ounces, three ounces uh, per person. And if you're going to kind of go what you said, like, let's just make this dinner tonight and have fun with it. Thinking about five ounces or so, six ounces of the meat um, with the accoutrements or all the other little things um, kind of make a better for a better meal. If okay. that makes so sense. Two ounces per person if you're doing it as a starter. Yep. And I would kind of build it the same way, though. I would kind of start to divide your space. I don't like everything on top of each other, but as you start to build, you can really have fun with the garnishes. And I was making pizza with famous pizza maker, you know, Chris Bianco at one point, and he was talking about how he tops the pizza. And I'll never forget because he's always looking for the sort of white space, like the space in between to fill up. So this is where we start to have that conversation with the charcuterie board. We're kind of looking at the white space and we're saying, okay, we've got cheese, we've got this left. Uh, we've already stacked our board pretty well right now. And I'm kind of leaving the edges free, but this is where um, you start to sort of fill in the gaps and figure out what touches what, you know, if you have guests that uh, maybe you don't want, you know, nut allergies or different things, you can build two boards, you can build three, you can put everything that's uh, sort of vegetarian friendly on the other piece and then just keep the meats on one, keep the cheese on the other. So it's, yeah. it's really, uh, again, just dependent on your audience. In a well, way. I love what you were saying about the individual plates because um, I recently went to a social distancing gathering and um, the host actually made um, each pod of like each family that was coming to the get together made them an individual charcuterie plate so that we didn't have to go over to a, a common plate. So we're making one big board today, but you could easily, as you said, uh, create individual boards um, with all of the olives and pickles and honey and nuts that you want. Um, exactly. So, um, and we can talk about that. We should make a fun plate here in a second about, you know, also utilizing the box in a way that kind of almost is the board, but steps away a little bit, maybe like with the figs and prosciutto and other things that you can do with the package that was sent out, you know, because okay. there's a lot of, I mean, there's obviously two or three days of uh, fun you can have with this box. Um, so we should do that. Hold me to that here in a second. Yeah, let's, let's so we're going into cheese right now and it's kind of similar. You want to make sure that maybe some of the cheeses we can break up and that's the whole thing. There's definitely cheeses out there that really recommend you either, you know, take the edge of the knife and just sort of break off pieces or you cut the cheese. Um, so I'm just taking the, the younger cheddar um this one is the, is that the prairie is breeze one? yes the okay. prairie breeze so a little bit younger cheddar i'm just kind of breaking that up and that can provide like pretty fun mouthfeel and so and I, just and broke a few pieces it tells, here it tells um all of our home cooks tuning in that you know if you try to slice the cheese and it breaks apart it's okay if it looks crumbly does it doesn't have to look like perfect little slices no Definitely not. In fact, it looks like, you know, it looks like craft cheese for sure. I mean, look how beautiful this breaks apart. I'm just barely putting the knife in and twisting it. And it's just like, I mean, that's just a great, that's a great cheese. Um, and so with the other one, the little longer aged, I'm going to do more, a little more in the slices. That's the, um, the truckle cheese. It's triangular shaped for everyone out yes. there. Yeah. This is the one I, I haven't tried it in a while, so I'm going to snack as well for a second. I'm sorry if you can hear me chewing. I, I would be snacking more. I'm just afraid to get food in my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, just stacking these, kind of fanning them out. I'm actually going to leave some space. As I mentioned earlier, this pepperoni, I think, is a great fit for the spreadable cheese. So this is quirk, which I believe is just, you know, similar to goat cheese, uh, um, but made with cow's milk. Um, yes, I, I told you, I confessed earlier, I cheated and had some of the quirk cheese on my toast this morning with roasted okay. beets on top of it. So 
Um, sorry, I, I, I know we're uh, promoting meat here and not, uh, not veggies, but you know, gotta eat our veggies too. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I would just kind of scrape this cheese, kind of ball it up in the container and don't worry about it too much again. This is gonna be rustico, you know, but. So you're just- uh, This is gonna be a great cheese too, as we start to garnish, you know, um, I think for, you know, the honey, but I like it with the pepperoni. I actually like the pepperoni with this cheese, with the honey, it kind of all starts to work. And that's again, you're kind of the DIY board expert, and then you're relying, you know, you're kind of giving that away to whoever's eating it to sort of build their own world with this too. Um, so we've got those two cheeses, or actually all three cheeses down. So yeah, this is the, the, the first part of the box, which is the meat and the cheese. Um, and then, you know, if any of you have gone out and this is where the conversation just, again, becomes more about what you want, but um, I brought a loaf of baguette from our bakery today. Uh, bread, I mean, maybe we could talk about bread for a second. It's not always something that you necessarily need on charcuterie. I think a lot of people think that you have to have crackers and ob obviously I'm a massive supporter of good bread. Um, and so, you know, but Sarah, do you always do the bread? Is that a thing for you? <laughs> I would have actually picked up some bread from your bakery today, dry storage. Um, but for me, whether to use bread or crackers always depends on what's gonna come next. And since one of your restaurants, the one I live near is a pizza place, I tr personally, I try not to fill up on bread if I know I'm that gonna have sense. pizza. But since tonight is a meal, I'm, I'm kind of wishing that I would have uh, gotten that baguette. So I'll have to pick up a baguette this weekend. Um, so I think, yeah, I like, I like the crunch of crackers or the, 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 um, the, the mouth, the tooth feel of bread um, as a textural, like you were saying earlier, um, you're mixing up the textures of the meat, sausage, the summer sausage here, the Nyman Ranch summer sausage obviously has a different texture than the prosciutto, the cheese textures. Um, so for me, it's a textural element uh, that I like to add. For sure. And that goes back to what I said in the beginning, something salty, something briny, something bready, something soft. Like that's really the magic of the charcuterie board is to try to wrap all the elements into it and then not overdo one side of it, not have too many things that are just um, sweet. So we do have a little bit of honey. Um, I picked up some mustard, the figs that I mentioned earlier. Um, we have a couple different kinds of nuts and olives. And again, this is just stuff that we just threw together, but, and I might use it all. I might not, I might decide like, you know, I'll serve the olives on the side or not serve them at all. But these figs is where I'm going to start. Nice. So really there's, there's, there's no mistakes. I mean, I've even seen pickled veggies or preserves um, served on a board. Uh, if you've got pickles in your fridge, I mean, it, it's really like this is seems like one of those meals that you could just dig in your refrigerator and say, what do I have in there? What do I need to use? Uh, you got a few pickles that you want to get rid of. You got some, you know, olives at the bottom of a jar, kind of like anything goes. Yeah. And so with the figs, it's something that I'm definitely trying to highlight. And this is something that... Um, you know, you might think about, is there an ingredient that you're really proud of? Did you marinate olives in your house? Did you pickle your own pickles? Did you buy like pickles you love? And kind of making sure that you're saying, you know what, like this fig kind of goes with everything. You can kind of put it out there. It goes with everything. And um, so, you know, this is something that I'm just saying, this is the time of year it is. This is what I want to highlight. So I'm just going to throw it kind of all over. And then as I start to build the other ingredients, um, Again, this great honey is good on the cheese. It's going to be good on the figs. And if you have a little spoon, it's just great to kind of set on the board too. Um, yeah. So you can just, you don't necessarily have to apply it to anything really, because this is just makes a great condiment that, um, you know, given the right utensil can be great on every plate. So um, I'm going to pull some mustard out. Um, and this is where, you know, like I said, the fig I want to highlight, but the, uh, the other things kind of might have more of a specific purpose. 
the cheese next to the pepperoni, the mustard next to these fatty uh, pieces over here. So I, I put the mustard between the Genoa and the sausage because I think, you know, it's really rich and, um, you know, this implies that it goes with that. Nice. And so and I think just you wanted to similar with the cheese. Like sometimes you can kind of signal what things go with by putting it next to each other. So putting, putting the um, mustard, putting the honey. Um, uh, one of the questions coming in from our audience guest uh, is uh, if you could repeat what you were saying about, um, you know, have something salty, have something sweet, have something briny. What are all those kind of, flavor profiles um that you think about to make sure that you have you know a holistic charcuterie board um yeah so i mean it, it's really kind of where we started i mean uh, a lot of these great meats and um especially if you're dealing with pork and not lean maybe like for sala is beef right it's very lean but when you dive into the, the these specific meats um, you want something to cut through it. So that's where the acid and the fat uh, really helps. So um, sometimes you can see even certain pieces garnished with something. I brought some uh, saba, which is some sweet pressed grapes. Really goes a long ways to uh, bring everything together. And instead of just eating, you know, fat or eating, um, you know, say, again, you see these things served with all kinds of fruit and grapes and everything. So I like the range of thinking about, and this is how, I mean, I approach food in our restaurant. I try to think about the menu and across the board, I don't want too much rich food. I want to add some meat. I want to add a little bit of chicken, uh, a lot of these great vegetables this time of year and really sort of round it out. And really it's that rounding out uh, that I'm talking about. So here specifically, we have the honey uh, as being very sweet. We have the earthiness of the fig. Uh, I think the fig really, uh, again, represents sort of the market right now and, and uh, that, that earthiness um, or bitterness even. Uh, some of the nuts act that way. Um, I love uh, nuttiness next to even, you know, some of the animals are fed with like acorns and finished with, you know, there's this whole uh, intense thing around what the animals are eating. And sometimes it's really fun to showcase that, but it also, you know, really helps draw out the flavor profile of the meat. So if you have nuts or, you know, these, these certain characteristics, like prosciutto is a little bit nutty. Um, you want to add the nuts just to sort of draw those flavors out of the meat as well. So not only does it, you know, it, it sort of rounds out the whole board. It also accentuates the, the flavor within the meat itself. If that makes sense. Another question coming in from our audience um, is what um, parts of the hog are these types of meat coming from? Uh, can, can, we, uh, can we go through the meats and, and talk? Yeah, so prosciutto, again, we talked about in the beginning, prosciutto and the capricola are both whole muscle. So that's really where you get an identifier. In fact, a lot of the uh, specific names are named after cuts um, and capricola being like, the shoulder, the neck area, the prosciutto is uh, a leg, essentially. So, and then the rest is, like I said earlier, utilizing the whole kind of parts of the pig. Um, but that's what you have in the box today is really the the neck, shoulder, and the um, and the uh, leg with the prosciutto. Um, and then another question regarding eating. And uh, like I said, I can only see you, so I'm assuming the audience might be getting a, a panned uh, view of the uh, finished board, or we should show them the beautiful board that you created. But uh, the question is, honey on the meat or honey on the cheese? Does it matter? Uh, it doesn't matter. And, it, you know, again, it's personal preference. Uh, my personal preference is, you know, probably just a little bit with the cheese, but you know, this with the spiciness, like one of my favorite pizzas out there is like spicy pepperoni with like honey drizzled on it with Calabrian chili. So really uh, when you get into those spicy meats, like the pepperoni, I think the honey works really well. Oh, great. But yeah, it's a way to uh, kind of counterbalance the heat. I hadn't mm -hmm. thought that. Um, I always eat cheese to cool my mouth down, but now I'm gonna have to think about adding a little bit of sweet uh, on there as well. Great. Um, Absolutely. 
can um, you show the finished board? Um, yeah, you know, I haven't put everything on. I'm just going to add a couple olives. Of course. I love the questions, so keep the questions coming. It should totally be <laughs> the conversation. And I'm going to open my fridge and uh, show the wine. Pardon my Italian pronunciation. It's called Clayto Chiarli. Uh, and uh, hopefully I'm holding that up straight so you can see it. And uh, I bought this at Basta. I don't know if you sell it anywhere else for our Colorado viewers and any of your other restaurants. But, you know, one of the things I want to talk about before we, um, uh, and again, just to our audience, encouraging you to send in your questions. Um, we're getting to the last 15 minutes or so. Um, of our Build the Charcuterie class, um, gathering together virtually around the dinner table tonight. Um, so we're happy to continue answering your questions. But while we're waiting for those to come in, um, one of the things I wanted to remind people of, if you're not already aware, is that this class is actually part of an entire month-long celebration of the Nyman Ranch hog farmers that culminates in the Hog Farmer Appreciation Dinner. Um, and one of the things Kelly and I have had the privilege of doing, um, in fact, I think we've overlapped on a couple of years, I think I've gone to five or six, is this uh, celebration typically happens uh, in person with the entire network of Nyman Ranch farmers descending upon downtown Des Moines um, for basically, um, if, let's put it this way, if the James Beard Awards are called the Oscars of the food world, I would like to call the Nyman Ranch Hog Farmer Appreciation Dinner the Oscars of the farming world or the Oscars of the hog farming world. And so, uh, Kelly, I think our audience would probably love to hear from you um, what it's like when you actually get a chance to go to Iowa, tour the farms, take a hay ride, um, and actually you've cooked uh, for these farmers before. So what, what, what's your experience been? Yeah, I, it was transformative for me. I mean, it's so much different when you get to, yeah, I remember walking with Paul uh, and, you know, every time I meet someone like that, that's just been sort of entrenched in this idea and, in a, you know, it, and kind of stepping out, you know, almost renegade in a way, you know, at, at that moment when you drive out to these farms and you're passing a lot of larger farms and you get to some of these smaller uh, independent farms that uh, Nyman works with, it's really, a, uh, it's really an eye-opening experience. And it's probably, when I think about being a line cook in my entire career, it's probably one of the biggest highlights that I've ever experienced, getting to go there in a packed room of five, 600 farmers. And you're kind of nervous for a second. And then you just kind of realize that it's what an opportunity to give back in a way and, and cook for, for this community. But seeing the animals, seeing the way they're raised, looking and walking through the fields and then truly understanding it gives you that sense of appreciation uh, that I was talking about. When you think about making uh, the, these types of meats or building these types of boards, it's, uh, it provides a lot of texture in the, um, in the overall experience to think, you know, this isn't just pepperoni. This isn't just Genoa or prosciutto. That these, that this type of thing, uh, th these types of meats are are coming from that type of place. So in Iowa, I mean, that was just uh, pro again probably one of the highlights of my career, and I got to share it with you. And you know, well, that was you know, it's it's every year it's something I look forward to, and there isn't a dry eye in the room when you see how much care these farmers put into the food. And, you know, as mm -hmm. you said, and, you know, I want to point out that both you and I are wearing our good food for all t-shirts. Um, and, you know, what we mean by this uh, hashtag is it has to be good for everyone. It can't just be good for the eater. It can't just taste good and be cheap. It has to be good for the restaurant. It has to be good for the restaurant workers. It has to be good for the distributors. It has to be good for the farmers. And so, that's really what we're advocating is this notion that, you know, good food has to be good for everyone in order for it to be truly good. Um, but we're getting some more questions in. Um, so people um, 
uh, are obviously uh, eating and want to know more ways to use charcuterie. So uh, a question, obviously, Kelly, you and I have been talking a lot about pizza as much as we've been talking about charcuterie. The question is, um, can you put charcuterie on pizza? And then a, a second question relates to texture with cheese and um, should people be using cheese from different animals uh, so that there's always like perhaps like a goat or a cow or sheep? How do you, how do you think about charcuterie on pizza? And then uh, what are your thoughts on uh, cheese? Yeah, I mean, I love charcuterie on pizza. And the only thing you have to be careful of is like, if you happen to be uh, cooking on an oven like the one behind me or over fire, like, you know, because a lot of them are cured with salt, you have to be careful about the balance of that. But inherently, you know, pepperoni is the number one condiment of, you know, the American uh, choice of pizza. So, you know, that is slightly cured and, um, you know, and cooked. And so there's a balance there uh, with the style of cooking you're doing. Sometimes if you cook a pan pizza in your oven, you might not want to put certain types of charcuterie on there, salami, because it could get really salty and kind of pull up, uh, like, you know, get pretty uh, dried up quick uh, because of all the salt. Um, I love finishing any of our pizzas, uh, any style with fresh charcuterie. So you're literally like finishing with prosciutto, finishing with some of the other salami right when the pizza comes out and it just kind of warms it a little bit and sinks in. It's like such a, doesn't always have to be cooked from the beginning. So a great finishing, uh, uh, you know, finishing a pizza with a uh, charcuterie. Um, yeah. What about cheese? What are your thoughts on cheese, different types of cheese? Love it. Uh, just on pizza or just totally in general? I mean, in both. Just general, like, is it important to have different yeah. represented? I think it, you know, again, talking about diversity on the board, uh, really representing different animals and both in the cheese and meats, I think are a lot of fun. You know, one of the things we didn't talk about is like something spreadable. When I mentioned like you should have these different textures, the spreadable cheese today is like perfect for this board, but also having like you know, uh, a duck riette or thinking about other types of animals to make bring diversity to the board is a lot of fun. Um, and also, you know, obviously with cheese on pizza, you have to be careful again on certain ones, some melt if you're looking for melty versus not, but I would put any of these um, uh, cheddars on there or even co combined with, if you're used to doing mozzarella, you could add some of the cheddar for a little more depth of flavor on a pizza or flatbread or anything. So charcuterie has a very big place on, on flatbreads and pizza, for sure. What, what other uses can you see? Because remember, everybody got two of each type of meat in their package. Yeah. So I'm imagining people might have used one of every um, meat today, um, but they're going to be looking ahead to the weekend. And um, what are other things that you would like to do with uh, these types of meat? Could you give us yeah, some I, suggestions? Well, I mentioned earlier, like, again, you know, it has a certain place for chefs like Chris Constantino and other guys that just make this their whole life work. That's really becomes sort of the makeup of the meal. Like you talked about in our restaurants, we just try to make it a part of it. You know, it's a part of what we do. And this is a great way to start in all of that. But typically we're more in place and I was thinking about it and I can do one real quick. But if I had the leftover figs and I was just like, well, what else could we do with all of this? But um you know, I'm cutting, quartering, slicing, whatever. Uh, a real famous dish in Italy is prosciutto con malone. So if you're bringing in peaches or figs or melon or anything, a lot of this can work as a uh, secondary, you know, meal. But, um, and uh, obviously a lot of this works with sandwich. So taking that, the rest of the baguette and cutting it open and adding tomatoes and prosciutto Prosciutto, I mean, you could just, you know, all day. But some of the others, like with the um, with the Genoa, with the pepperoni, with the soppressata, like the, all of those are, you know, great ways to just like stuff in a sandwich or baguette. And you've got lunch for the next, you know, two, three days for yourself and the kids or, or what have you. So, um, what, but just, you, you know, this is just using leftovers and I can show you. I don't know if actually making sure the camera can see, but um, 
I just sliced some figs. Um, I've got some prosciutto. I'm going to take some of these leftover pistachios and just kind of break them up. And this is just, I mean, really all of this stuff kind of goes together in a way, which is again, why it's fun to kind of take a piece of baguette or cracker when you're eating the charcuterie board and just, you're trying to assemble something, you know, but, um, and I mentioned the Saba earlier, this is part of, um, uh, pressing, you know, grapes for wine, but, um, it kind of is a uh, really sweet and you could do this with balsamic and everything or anything, but doing that, maybe salting the figs a little bit. Hmm. And this is this, you know, stuff that we've literally found a burrito. This is not very pre-planned, uh, but this is, you know, just a simple salad. I would add, and I know you can't see this, Sarah, I've kind of got it on the, but, um, more you more. know, adding, adding arugula, adding greens to this. I mean, you've got a great salad. Charcuterie is incredibly versatile. Um, and there's really anything that you can add to or do with uh, a rounded meal or make it the meal, like you said. Nice. So another question coming in is um, going back to the main board that you created, which by the way, I should try to show you mine. <laughs> I would love to see yours. See if I was a good student. Um, I'm missing some things because I wanted to stay with the conversation. But uh, is when you do put out a board uh, for a get together, do you usually keep some of the meat in the refrigerator and then um, like refill it, like keep some as backup? Do you have um, a separate board that you can just replace? Like how do you suggest people think about replenishing a charcuterie board at a get together? Because they can get a little messy. They can. And I mean, us in the restaurant, if we're hosting, you know, guests in the restaurant, um, we typically, uh, you know, we'll build a secondary board and that's not to say that everything out there is like, you don't discard or whatever, but sometimes we'll bring it back and we'll just always, you know, try to replenish and make it full by bringing, you know, kind of putting two in the rotation, I should say, you don't need six in the rotation, but having another backup, if it's that type of thing, um, it, you know, if it's just, let's just, you know get into it and eat it and finish it. And this is it. And it's the meal. But if it's, if you're hosting a gathering, I would recommend two uh, and just rotating those out. So anytime we look at about like 50%, like if it's 50% and I know that seems like a lot, but it also allows us to kind of rebuild off of that um, and just keep, um, keep it fresh. Yeah. Okay. And one question came in, uh, obviously, probably, I think this uh, audience member must be having the same challenge that I'm having, which is, I'm working on a smaller board. So how do you know when you're like over the top? <laughs> how do you know when to stop? Um, you know, I, I talked about white space a little bit. I think that that's probably your signal, although I could keep stacking on all of those, right? So maybe I have you know, two or three layers of the Genoa. So you can really, I would say, stick with the, with the thing you're plating and stack high if you need to. Um, that is perfectly okay. You could start with one and just build up. And so on a smaller board, you would not fan it out. I get upset with my chef sometimes for fanning out everything that they plate. They cut a steak, they fan it out. It's like not necessary. It actually holds better sometimes put together, not like prosciutto, but some of the others are great for stacking and you can start with just, you know, two little ones and just stack up and people, you know, if you roll it, especially, it's real easy to navigate that. But I don't think that there's like a moment. I, you know, I think some of the greatest boards at parties are the ones you walk in and you just get that wow factor. You're like, whoa, this is a yeah. lot and it's abundance. okay. It says abundance. abundance. Yeah, it's abundance. Yeah. Great, great. Well, Chef Kelly, thank you so much. Um, this has been super educational and I will try to show you my board without, without uh, having everything slide off of it. Um, but, uh, and I love that new technique that you taught us with the pepperoni to make the little pepperoni cones. So uh, thank you. It seems like from the questions that are coming in, people are having a lot of fun. In fact, some people are asking, this was so much fun. When can I take the next class? And so I want to encourage you all that there is an upcoming class uh, on September 10th. So mark your calendars. 
Um, if you enjoyed this class with Chef Kelly, we're sort of the opening act for Chef Thomas Keller, uh, the highly acclaimed chef from California. You might know his restaurant, uh, restaurant, uh, original restaurant, I should say, The French Laundry, um, also has Per Se in New York um, and several others. He is going to be doing the Hog Farmer Appreciation Dinner on September 10th, and you could register for that class and get your kit for that class, and then there'll be a live demonstration with Chef Thomas Keller by going to the website Nyman Ranch HFAD.com. That HFAD stands for Hog Farmer Appreciation Dinner. Um, and uh, I highly recommend um, uh, now that you've gotten the hang of these video classes, um, the proceeds from that class, like tonight's class, are all going to benefit uh, the Next Generation Foundation. Um, so again, huge thank you to Chef Kelly. Um, you know, we know this is a difficult time for independent farmers, uh, for independent restaurants, and uh, we all have to do our part to vote with our forks and to vote with our dollars and continue to support good food, good farmers and good companies like Nyman Ranch, good independent restaurants like all of Kelly Whitaker's uh, restaurants, um, and a food system that is really good for all, that works for everyone. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, spending your evening with us around our virtual charcuterie board. Um, and thank you again to Chef Kelly and to Nyman Ranch uh, for inviting me to host this for them. Enjoy your evening and wish everyone good night. Bye, thanks everyone.